The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You've anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely, goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Well, good morning, and we're glad you're here. If you're watching online, we're so glad that you're watching with us. And so we're continuing our series today on the goodness of God, and we're looking at Psalms 23. And last week we looked at why we need a good shepherd that we can trust. And today we're going to look at how to relax in the good shepherd as the good shepherd restores us. God has a deep concern for every one of you that are here and every one of you that are listening. The well-being of the sheep, though, depends upon the type of man that owns it. I'm so glad that to have the FFA group here, and uh, wow, I didn't even know you were going to be here when we started talking about sheep and stuff, so you guys are the experts, because I grew up in the city, so you can proof text me on some stuff here. But some shepherds are very wise, and they're very gentle, and they're kind, and they're intelligent and brave, and their sheep always do well. However, there are those shepherds who are selfish and uncaring about their sheep, and under them, the sheep would struggle and starve and suffer endless hardships. I want to ask you today, who is your shepherd? You know, there's one of two shepherds, and I know that that's pretty simplistic, but that's the true reality. Is God your shepherd? You see, the good shepherd cares for us. He watches over us. He protects us, and he preserves us. But if the good shepherd's not your shepherd, then the reality is Satan may, is your shepherd. The world, the flesh, and the devil, and they're wretched, and they're cruel taskmasters. They're always tempting, and they're always condemning you. Those who know the good shepherd realize that God, the good shepherd, that the ownership of themselves is legitimate. They know that God deliberately created you. Everyone here, God created. Every one of you listening, God created. And he bought you with a great price, the price of his son Jesus' blood. Well, I'm going to just read again Psalms 23 to you because it's just such a wonderful Psalms. And, and David says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Today we're going to be focusing on those first three verses. Paul told young Timothy, contentment plus godliness is great gain. When we think about the shepherd making the sheep lie in green pastures, you need to realize that sheep refuse to lie down unless they're free of fears. If they have fear going on, they will not lay down and they won't rest. They must have a freedom from fear and from tension and from aggravation and hunger. A flock that is restless and discontented, always agitated and disrupted, never does well. And do you realize the same is true with people? Nothing is more quieting, nothing is more reassuring to the sheep than when the shepherd is present. The sheep must have a, a keen awareness that the shepherd is nearby. And sometimes the sheep must slow down and sometimes they need to show how they can relax. The truth is a lot of people don't know how to relax. Too many people today are addicted to adrenaline. We don't know how to just slow down and just smell the roses. Studies have shown that the average American today is sleep deprived. You get two hours on an average less sleep than people did 50 years ago. You might say, well, that's because we're smarter. No, it's because I think we're dumber. Because we need sleep. We simply don't know how to relax in our culture today. We don't know how to rest. A lot of Americans are like Job 20, 18 in the message paraphrase where it says, they are unable to relax and enjoy anything they work for. Vacations today don't seem to be relaxing for people. They seem to be marathons. 
In the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, he gives us 10 reasons that the, uh, that the sheep does uh, need him. And one of the things that the good shepherd does is that they make sure the sheep get enough rest in order to stay healthy. And that takes us to verse 1 and 2. The Lord is my shepherd, so I have everything I need. He makes me to lie down in green pastures, and he leads me beside the quiet waters. These images today are actually metaphors, and they represent rest and refreshment. I really was impressed with the kids. For I couldn't remember all those things from high school. They, were, they did a good job. Jessica, where are you? You, good, good review. So, a test next week. All right. Well, I hope we pass. I'm, I'm going to let somebody. I, I'm going to cheat. <laughs> to give God our best requires rest. If you don't rest, then you're going to stress. In fact, the difference between being blessed and being stressed is often rest. I didn't write that in your notes, but that's pretty good. The difference between being blessed and being stressed is often rest. Well, let's look at some common reasons from the Bible that people don't relax. First of all, we have sometimes a misplaced identity. We base our worth on our work. One of the reasons why people can't relax is that they confuse their work with their worth. If I really work hard and succeed, then I must be very valuable. Solomon, the wisest man in the world, wrote Ecclesiastes, and he said this about it. He said, the struggle of fools weary them, for they don't know how to go to the city. When we have misplaced identity and we uh, think our worth is based on our work, then we're going to put all of our time, all of our money, all of our energy, and all of our effort into our work. Number two is materialism, always wanting more things. When I have more things, then I've got to make more money, and then I've got to make uh, more money to take care of it, and I have to work harder, and I have to work more hours. The Bible says, don't do this. Proverbs, which Solomon also wrote, says, don't wear yourself out to get rich because you know better. Stop. As soon as your eyes fly on it, it disappears, for it makes wings for itself and flies like an eagle to the sky. And another reason why people just don't seem to get enough rest is envy. They want to be like other people. I'm trying to keep up with the Joneses. I'm trying to keep up with my neighbors. I'm trying to keep up with everybody else. And that causes me to do things that I don't really have the time to do. We do things we don't need. or We, we buy things we don't need and often don't want to do things that we do because other people are doing them. How many of you would all agree that peer pressure is real? They used to do surveys for graduating seniors, and up until 1980, when they uh, had graduating seniors, they asked them this question, who is the most influential people in your life? And up until 1980, it was always the parents. Do you know what happened in 1980 when this, they surveyed, and it's still this way today? When they're asked, who are the most influential person in your life, they say they're peers. That's a little scary. Who influences you? Who are you really trying to be like? Solomon said, I saw that all labor and all skilled work is due to one person's jealousy of another. This too is futile in its pursuit of the wind. Another thing people do is they start valuing achievement over relationships. We've all known people who've walked away from marriages because, uh, because of their careers. Or they've walked away from being a good parent or just being a good friend. Do you realize that in order to have a friendship and a relationship, it takes time? And if you don't put the time in developing relationships, one day everyone in this room is going to need somebody. And if you haven't developed those relationships, if you haven't had the time, then you're going to be in big trouble. Solomon said, again, I, I saw futility under the sun. There's a person without a companion, without even a son or a brother. And though there is no end to all of his struggles, his eyes are still not content with riches. What Solomon's saying he's here, he's saying, you know, people get rich, but they sabotage their families. They sabotage their friends. And all of a sudden, they're rich, but they have no one. No one. He goes on to say, who am I struggling for, he asked, and depriving myself of good things. This, too, is futile. And a miserable task. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their efforts. Another reason is insecurity. When I'm afraid, I don't have enough. That's a real problem today. And Solomon says, all of my pers person's labor is for his stomach. Get the appetite is never satisfied. The psalmist said, in vain you get up early and stay up late, working hard to have enough food. Yes, he gives sleep to the one he loves. 
My dad, uh, my grandfather grew up during the Depression, and he was a farmer. And I tell you what, there's not very many farmers that aren't religious because, you know, you're depending so much on the weather, and you're doing a lot of praying for rain and for sometimes for the rain to stop. And my grandfather talked a lot about how hard it was during the Depression. And my father, that, that, that resonated with him. And, and all the time that my dad was alive, I still remember my dad worrying about what if he lost his job or what if he didn't have enough money for retirement. How many of you worry about those things? Some people are being honest and some people are saying, I'm not going to raise my hand for anything. And the, the young people are saying, what are you talking to me about this? I'm not even out of school yet. But we tend to be insecure, more insecure than we would ever believe. And if we don't have that real security of knowing the Good Shepherd and knowing the Good Shepherd will be with us, knowing that He's with us and guides us and directs us, we're in trouble. There's five antidotes to uh, live a, a rest-filled life or a restful life. First of all, we need to remember our value to God. God created you to love you and for you to love Him. It's not what I do that gives me worth, but it's who I belong to. You belong to the good shepherd. Isaiah said, look, I've inscribed you in the palm of my hand. Your walls are continually before me. Someone once said that when you meet God, don't ever ask him to see his children. Because you realize that we are God's children. We're his creation. And he loves you and he cares about you. And his wallet must be really good, big because you know, if you want to see all of the pictures, you're going to be there for a long, long time. Number two, we need to enjoy what I have. Paul said this, he said, I know how to make do with little, and I know how to make do with a lot. If any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being content, whether well-fed or hungry, whether in abundance or in need, I am able to do all things through him who strengthens me. You see, Paul knew what it was like to be hungry. He also knew what it was like to have a lot. He knew what it was like to have money. He knew what it was like to not have money. These things he learned, and all of this he learned to be content in whatever he was, knowing that God was with him, knowing that God cared, knowing that God had a purpose for him, knowing that things were going to be all right. Number three, I limit my work to six days a week. God commands this. In Exodus it says, you are to labor six days and do all of your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. You must not do work. You, your sons, your daughters, your male, your female servants, your livestock, or the resident aliens who is within your city gates. So what do you do on the Sabbath? First of all, number one, the first thing you do on the Sabbath is you rest your body. The second thing is you, that you do on the Sabbath is you recharge your emotions through quietness and solitude. You know, it's okay to have recreation. It's okay to have things that you do with your family on the Sabbath. And number three, I focus my, refocus my spirit. That's worship. That's why we're worshiping on the Sabbath. I've had the, the, the fortune to go to Israel a few times, and, and one of the things that has always amazed me when I go to Israel is how they uh, really do celebrate and they keep Shabbat or the Sabbath, which is on a Saturday for them. On Friday, the, the Israelis, they get out of work around noon because they go home, and what do they do when they go home? They do all their cooking for Shabbat or for the Sabbath, and they put it in warming ovens. We have a couple here at church, Lonnie and Myra Glower. They taught school here in Buffalo for over 30 years, and they bought a new stove, and it, had, and it wouldn't work on, on Saturdays. Whatever they did, that stove would not work on Saturday. It worked perfect every other day. And so they called, and they had a serviceman come out, and the service says, oh, I know how to fix this. And they said, well, this is the weirdest stove we ever had. It works six days a week, and on Saturday it won't work. It won't turn on. And he said, it has a Shabbat setting. And he turned it off the Shabbat setting because the stove... When I was in Israel, you can't do a lot of things that we do normally. If you're at a hotel, no matter how high it is, you can't push buttons. So they stop at every single floor because they think that's work. When you get in your room, you can't adjust your thermostat. So it comes on when you go in and it goes off when you go out. And Betsy and I, the last time we were there, our thermostat was off. It turned off when we came in and turned on when we left. And that was a bad thing. So Betsy broke the bathroom and we got a new room. No. She didn't break it on purpose. That's another story in itself. <laughs> she did. They were having riots in Jerusalem at that time, and she, uh, it, she, the, the bathroom sink exploded, and, and people thought that there was a bomb going off in the hotel, and we almost, I don't know, it was just a bad deal. Just a bad deal. Just, but it wasn't me that did it. It was her that did it. So, so, and she got caught working because she's washing out clothes, so she's in trouble. So anyway, that's, that's nothing to do with the sermon. But uh, anyway, it was just kind of funny. 
But we really do need to learn some things. I mean, Sunday is our Sabbath, and we come together and we worship. And when we go home, we ought to be able to take, the older you get, the more Sunday afternoon naps uh, are appreciated. If you're younger, when you get older, you'll find that out. But it's a great day to do things with your family. You know, when Anna was little, I still remember some of the games that I didn't particularly care for, but I did it because I love her and I played it. Anybody ever play a game called Candyland? How many times can you play Candyland? And then I, I just, Betsy came in and Anna was crying and she said, why is Anna crying? I said, because she lost. And she said, I said, well, she, she said, well, why did you beat her? I said, because life is tough, you know. <laughs> and she said, but she's just two, you know. But my worst thing that she loved to play was dress up. I won't even go into that. That was not fun. But the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And number four, I need to adjust my values. This will reduce the busyness of your life when you focus on what is truly important. Jesus said, for what is a prophet or gain uh, someone to gain the whole world and yet lose his life? Number five, you need to accept, excuse my restlessness for God's peace. Jesus said, consider the birds in the sky. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth more than they? Can any of you add one moment to your life span by worry? So let's just kind of do this. Let's think of relax. R, remember my value. E, enjoy what I have. L, limit my work to six days. A, adjust my values. And the X is exchange my restlessness for God's peace. And yes, that's a misspelling. It starts with an E. So. But preachers do that. So. There's something else the Good Shepherd does for us. He restores my soul. My soul is the part of me that thinks and chooses and feels. What damages my soul? Well, unaddressed grudges. Job said, for anger kills a fool and jealousy slays the gullible. He also said, you who tear yourself in anger, should the earth be abandoned on your account or a rock be removed from your place? Unconfessed guilt is something that will damage our emotions. The psalmist said, in my iniquity, I have flooded over my head. They are a burden too heavy for me to bear. My wounds are foul and festered because of my foolishness. I am bent over and brought very low. All day long I go around in mourning. Also, we need to make sure that we have this grief and we need to process it because often grief is unprocessed. The psalmist said, be gracious to me, Lord, because I am in distress. My eyes are worn out from frustration, my whole being as well. Well, how does Jesus restore our soul? Because we have this good shepherd and he's available for us and he's died for us and he loves us. And Jesus truly is the good shepherd and we need to be close to him. We need to know that he's protecting us. We need to know that he's always after our well-being. So what are some of the ways that he restores your soul? First of all, Jesus turns my hurt into holiness. Is there anybody here who's never been hurt? We have all been hurt, and we live in a world that's just filled with hurts. We're filled to live in a world where there's a lot of injustice. We live in a world where there's a lot of people who are treated very badly. The psalmist said, he is my faithful love and my fortress, my stronghold and my deliverer. He is my shield, and I take refuge in him. He subdues my people under me. I love what Paul said in Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Number two, Jesus takes my sins on himself at the cross. You see, what he did on the cross is he was nailed on the cross and he shed his blood for what we did, nothing for what he had done. Number three, Jesus feels my grief and he heals my heart. Grief is more than just losing someone we love. Sometimes we grieve when we've had a loss in our life. Maybe it could be health. Maybe it could be a friend moving away. Maybe it could be a job situation. So we all grieve and Jesus heals my grief and he heals my heart. I love what the psalmist said. He healed the brokenhearted and bandages their wounds. How should I respond to the good shepherd? Because he is a good shepherd. There are three things that we need to respond to what Jesus has done for us because of our guilt and our grief and our grudges. There's no one that can take away guilt, grief, and grudges but Jesus. And it's three things that plague mankind. There are so many people that, that are mentally ill and physically ill because of the guilt and grief and grudges of their lives. Jesus never wants us to forget the sacrifice he made to handle our grudges and our griefs and our guilt. So how do we respond? Well, first of all, trust the good shepherd to forgive my sins. 
Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? Sometimes, I, you know, when I was younger as a Christian and even older, sometimes I think, God, I just wish I could pray and not sin anymore. Anybody ever want to do that? Well, that's not going to happen until we get to heaven because we're all sinners saved by grace. But what happens is when we sin and fall short of God's glory, that's what it means to fall short of the mark. God loves us and the good shepherd comes and he forgives us. And he says, I forgive you. I take away your guilt. Number two, we need to release my offenders and focus on the future. Don't let them get under your skin anymore because your soul cannot be restored until you let go of resentment in your mind or your thoughts. You have to let go of revenge in your emotions and you have to let go of retaliation in your actions and in your decisions. You're going to be offended. You're going to have people do stuff that's not nice. You're going to have people do things that that are wrong. You're going to have people that will mistreat you. And how we respond to them is going to show how God is really alive in our lives. You see, the normal thing is we return evil for evil. If somebody does me wrong, I'm going to do them wrong. You ever heard the expression, I'm not going to get even, I'm not going to get ahead? That's the natural response. But Jesus has taught us a better way. You see, the good shepherd, this is extraordinary. This is stuff that is like nobody can do without God's help. You see, the right way to do it is to return good for evil. And we can't do that without God's help. Number three, I team up with Jesus to carry my load. God never intended you for you to go through life carrying all the guilt and grief and grudges, problems and pressures, stresses and situations by yourself. Jesus said, I want to team up with you. I want to yoke up with you. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me because I am lowly and humble in heart, and you will find rest in your soul, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We need to let the good shepherd teach us how to relax and how to restore our damaged soul, our minds and our wills and our emotions. The good shepherd can transform us. He can take my hurts and he can turn them into holiness. He can take and turn a conflict and chaos into character for my life. But the question is, will you trust him? Will you really let him? A song came out several years ago. The Newsboys, they made it famous because it's such a wonderful song. Our God's not dead. How many of you believe that? You know, Anna, she loves that song. When she sings it, she gets excited. And, and it's such a wonderful song. It has such wonderful words because here's the thing. No matter what you or I are going through, the goodness of God is always there. And God is not going to leave us nor forsake us. You see, God can remove our, our guilt and our grief and our grudges. And he can give us rest. I believe that with all of my heart. I believe with all of my heart what people need is Jesus They need that good shepherd to lead and guide and direct them to remove that guilt and the grief and the grudges and to give them rest. Now, believe it or not, I've given up some of my preaching time because in a moment we're going to sing a song. And you might say, well, that's kind of a weird song for an invitation because that's what this is, this part of the service. If God has spoken to your heart... There's people here who will pray with you. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, there's people here who will help you and and show you what the Bible says and and help you to believe in your heart and and, and show you what God's Word says. But we're going to sing a song of praise, but a song to remind every one of us, our God is not dead. Will you stand with me as we pray?